Hey everybody, welcome back to Star Trek Nitpickers. Lieutenant William here. I hope you're doing excellently. So today we're talking about the making of the best of both worlds. This all got kind of stirred up recently when Elizabeth Dennehy, who played Commander Shelby, did an interview on The Seventh Rule, the podcast hosted by Siroc Lofton, who played Jake Sisko on Star Trek Deep Space Nine. So I'm going to be reading from a few articles, and I'm going to share a bunch of quotes from different actors and people involved in the making of The Best of Both Worlds. But first, let me ask you to please subscribe if you haven't already, and to thank you if you have. It really does help us out, guys, and we are really in need of help to bring you more of the fan fiction that we've been doing with the cartoons, and also the live-action fan fiction project that we've got going on with Captain Haskins. So please do remember to subscribe, like, and share, and also leave a comment. Alright, so this is from a Screen Rant article. Star Trek The Next Generation's greatest Borg episode, The Best of Both Worlds, was also a cliffhanger for the actors, says Elizabeth Dennehy. As the smart and ambitious Commander Shelby, Dennehy was one of Star Trek The Next Generation's most memorable guest stars. A Borg expert, Shelby was a rival to Commander Will Riker, Jonathan Frakes. Yet Shelby became Riker's first officer when he took command of the USS Enterprise D after Captain Jean-Luc Picard, Patrick Stewart, was assimilated by the Borg. Elizabeth Dennehy appeared on The Seventh Rule, hosted by Siroc Lofton and Ryan T. Husk, to discuss Star Trek The Next Generation's The Best of Both Worlds, Part 1, which was TNG's first cliffhanger that rocked fans in the summer of 1990. Well, they actually discussed Part 2, too. Anyway, Dennehy pointed out that the actors also had no clue how TNG's cliffhanger would be resolved, and that she and Jonathan Frakes played multiple aspects of Riker and Shelby's relationship at once in anticipation of what would eventually happen when they returned to film part two three months later. People were losing their minds, but we were too. We Remember, we didn't have part two. We, we, I went home to New York for the summer to see friends and stuff, and everywhere I went, people were asking me, and I was like, dude, I don't have the script. We didn't have the script until right before we started shooting. I had no idea what was going to happen. So we were also on tender hooks. We had no idea how they were going to wrap the story up, where it was going to go, what was going to happen. We had no idea. So the other thing about those three months was I couldn't eat anything. Oh, it was a direct, uh, a direct pickup. And have you ever worn a spandex jumpsuit onesie? Sarah? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I have. And it is not flattering. Yeah. No, if I had a grape, it was going to show. I mean, I remember starving myself those three months. We had three hours before the storm front hit. Less than two hours now. Data was available. I took him. We came. I don't see your problem. When Jonathan and I were talking about the relationship between the, these two characters, uh, first of all, it was the first time they'd ever had a cliffhanger. Um, one of the things that we talked about was we had no idea where this relationship was going to go. And we had no idea if they were going to end up falling in love with each other yeah. or was I a Borg in disguise? We had no clue. And was I a villain or a hero? So we had to kind of play all of that all at once in case of any option that they chose. So all of those little smart smirks, like when I say um, um, data, um, scramble the phaser frequencies, keep them changing. And then Picard comes up and puts his hand on my shoulder. And I have that little smug self-satisfied, all those little looks and all those little moments and all those little, is she a good person or is she not was on purpose because we had no idea what it was going to turn into. Wow. And so what, what that allows you to do is play a 360 degree character of somebody who um, could have ulterior motives. What agenda is she working? But I think it made the audience lean in. Fluctuate phaser resonance frequencies. Random settings, keep them changing. Don't give them time to adapt. I, know, I think some, you might have told me this, that Michael Pillar wrote the first episode and then... Um, had to write the second one. Michael Piller said that he was having some trouble writing this episode because he was focusing on Picard, and then he realized that this was really 
a Riker episode, and Riker's story in this episode directly parallels what he was going through, feeling like he didn't really want to be second in command of Star Trek The Next Generation anymore. He kind of wanted to go and be the head of a show, which seems like it was an option at this point for him. But he was having a lot of fun working on The Next Generation, and he loved the people that he was working with, and he didn't really want to go and be the captain of another show and throw away what he had, which is pretty clearly what we see Riker going through. And it's just interesting to think of Best of Both Worlds as a Riker episode because, of course, everybody thinks of it as a Picard episode. This is the one where Picard gets kidnapped and traumatized and assimilated into the Borg Collective. Oh, no! Okay, so here's a quote from Ronald D. Moore, who was on the writing staff at this point and, of course, went on to write lots and lots of great Star Trek and other things. Here's his quote. It was the only show that year that we didn't actually sit in the room as a writing staff and break together. Michael said he wanted to go do it. Michael had a very personal connection to that particular story. The episode starts with Riker getting an offer to go command another ship. That's at the heart of it. Michael said very overtly that he was in a very similar place. He was the number two guy on the show and he was debating whether or not to leave Star Trek and go and run his own show, or if he wanted to remain second in command of the Enterprise, as it were. So he was Riker, and he wrote the story from that perspective. So Michael Piller wrote part one thinking he was possibly going to leave the show, and he wouldn't have to write part two. But then he decided not to leave the show, just like Riker decides not to leave the Enterprise, I've decided not to pursue that commission at this time. And Michael Piller found that he had to find a believable explanation for how things could possibly just go back to normal, which is what they always did at the end of a Next Generation episode. This is more or less the same thing that happened with Patrick Stewart. It's hard to get the real skinny on what went down exactly with Patrick Stewart at the end of the third season, but basically... He was talking about leaving the show. So, of course, the big bosses only hear that he wants more money. And so it's possible that part one opens a door for Picard to leave the show specifically because the studio wanted to make it clear to Patrick Stewart that they weren't really interested in paying him too much more money and they were basically okay with him leaving. So, it may have been a calculated move in a contract negotiation. I don't know if it was being used as a negotiating tool. I have no idea. I really don't. I don't know if anybody knows. The best of both worlds was difficult for Stewart, and not just because of the elaborate Borg makeup. In addition to spending four hours in a makeup chair to apply the machines to Stewart's face and head, the actor also began to see his personal plight as mirroring that of Picard's. In both fiction and reality, a person saw themselves being swallowed up by a machine. Stewart explained why in his new autobiography. But the physical discomfort wasn't as hard for Stewart as the emotional discomfort. Stewart had been acting on Star Trek for three years, a job that prevented him from appearing in extended stage productions, as he might have preferred. Indeed, Stewart began to see Star Trek as both a blessing and a curse. It certainly made him a celebrity, but it was a level of celebrity he never sought. Stewart wisely differentiated being an actor from being a star, and he clearly preferred the former. He longed to refine his craft and challenge himself, and being a celebrity was antithetical to that. Stewart had been assimilated into the fame machine. Here's a quote from Patrick Stewart. Locutus knew that John Luke was alive inside him, but helpless and trapped, which really resonated with me. The celebrity I had become knew that the normal, jobbing actor I'd been for most of my life was still there and was the real me. Doing those two episodes was emotionally close to home, and at times quite painful. 
The process of attaching all of Locutus's prosthetics to my head and body took about three hours, and their removal at the end of the day another hour. Now I understood why Michael Dorn, despite his congenital good cheer, often looked so miserable. Here's a quote from Michael Westmore, the makeup artist, that sort of seems to contradict the idea that Patrick Stewart was uh, having difficulty with the long makeup sessions. Patrick Stewart loved being in the makeup chair. He didn't care what it was, whether he was doing a Shakespearean character in the holodeck or doing the old age makeup on Inner Light. Patrick loved getting in the chair and getting made up. He would be putting his two cents in. Oh, let's do a little more shading right here, he'd say. He'd love that part of the process. And here's uh, another quote from Michael Westmore. This is actually about the scene right at the end of part one, and I think this is fascinating stuff. He says, My son, Michael Westmore Jr., found the laser we mounted on Patrick's head for the end of part one. It cost $200. It was a new product on the market and had never been used on TV previously. We thought, oh, this is going to be great. But we go into the set and we can't see it at all. The special effects guy said, let me put a little smoke in. And oh my god, that light cut right through everything. They wanted Patrick to look directly in the lens and nobody knew what was going to happen at all. Patrick turns to the camera, and the refraction between the laser and the mirrors in the camera made it look like it's just shattered everything. It's the one time executive producer Rick Berman called me and said, This is fantastic! Oh my god! It blew Paramount away. If it was an optical, it would have cost thousands of dollars, and we did it with a $200 laser. So that's the quote, and yeah, I think it's probably just one of those laser pointers that, uh, you know, people are always ruining movies with when you go to the movie theater nowadays. Here's a quote from Alan Sims, the property master. My pride with those episodes would be the prosthetic arms, for which I created remote control apertures. You would see it flicker and flip back and forth. When the one Borg came to the Enterprise and captured Picard, that was me off-camera with a little remote control with two controlled joysticks and antennae. Here's a quote from Jonathan Frakes, a.k.a. Commander William Riker. The episode was key to Riker's character. Previously, I thought it was not very cleverly handled to have Riker say in the first two seasons, All I want is to have my own ship. I aspire to be a captain in Starfleet. But then, when offered the ship, the writers put in Riker's mouth that he didn't feel he was ready to be captain, or he didn't want to leave his friends. All of us were quite thrilled they had the balls to leave Picard on the Borg cube. I don't know if they were trying to threaten Patrick with renegotiations. I don't know if it was being used as a negotiating tool. I have no idea. I really don't. I don't know if anybody knows. It's commonplace now. Shows like Lost and House of Cards, they'll kill off a regular and think nothing of it. This was 1990. It was not commonplace to be killing off any of your series regulars. Yeah, I couldn't help but think of The Walking Dead when reading that quote from Jonathan Frakes. And, I mean, well, even just think of Star Trek Discovery, a show that Jonathan Frakes is, uh, you know, one of the directors for. People, you know, I mean, all of the new Trek shows, basically, you can pretty much guarantee they're going to kill off a new character. Anyways, it's just interesting to think that, yeah, Patrick Stewart might have left the show and then Jonathan Frakes might have become the captain and Shelby might have become the first officer. It seems like maybe Shelby was being used as a tool to get Patrick Stewart to do some friendly, uh, you know, contract signing renegotiations because she's basically threatening not only Picard but Patrick Stewart by bringing her into this episode. You realize, Admiral, that with the assistance of Captain Picard, the Borg will be ready for your defenses. Of course, it's well known that Shelby was not a well-liked character, and maybe it was feedback that they got during the summer that led them to uh, realize that, uh, yeah, 
we don't we don't want to have Shelby as a regular on the show. It's not going to work out. Another thing that didn't work out was Patrick Stewart's attempt to hook up Elizabeth Dennehy and Brent Spiner. He managed to embarrass them both, and it seems likely this was his real intent. Brent was so shy, he never even said a single word to Dennehy. This appeared to be some kind of power waveguide conduits. Shelby was almost as hated as Soren, who actually was a very bad guy who killed Captain Kirk. Malcolm McDowell, who played Soren, actually received a number of death threats as a result of his role. Elizabeth Dennehy hasn't mentioned anything like that to the best of my knowledge, but she has had people yell insults at her at conventions, which is obviously totally unacceptable and ridiculous. She is, little known fact, actually the daughter of Brian Dennehy, who was in a lot of well-known movies including Tommy Boy, Righteous Kill, First Blood, Rambo, the one in 2008, and Cocoon, to name a few. He was an amazing character actor who played football before going into acting and doing a ton of theater work, as well as a ton of movies and a fair amount of television. I was lucky enough to see him star in The Death of a Salesman, a role he was widely acclaimed for on the stage in Boston. You might think that Elizabeth Dennehy was just given the role in Star Trek because of her dad and the way he was a well-loved character actor, but she had to audition for a lot of head honchos before she was actually given the role. And as beloved as her dad was, Commander Shelby was hated by fans, it's fairly safe to say. She's totally blind to the fact that the reality of serving on the ship requires an extreme amount of respect for the people around you. It doesn't really have much to do with how impressive it looks on your resume. She's a lot like that guy who ended up being king of the bug people in Conspiracy, Dexter Remick. Speaking of the king of the bug people, Michael Piller said the idea for the Borg having a queen had been going around the writer's room for a while, and he'd resisted it. Pillar felt one of the really special things about the Borg as an enemy was how they contrasted to our very personable main characters by having no personality whatsoever. So he resisted the idea of giving them a queen bee, but of course resistance is futile, and the idea that he had that struck him as interesting was to have Picard become the queen bee, and that is how Locutus was born. Interestingly, this was also the first time we learned the Borg assimilate people into their collective. Picard is the first one. Before this happened, we had no reason to think that they turned people into drones. That idea isn't even really in Best of Both Worlds, but I'm getting ahead of myself. In Q Who, the previous Borg episode, we see a baby Borg, making it seem like they have babies just like every other alien race, pretty much. From the look of it, the Borg are born as a biological life form. It seems that almost immediately after birth, they begin artificial implants. This connects to the last season of Star Trek Picard, but let me stay on track here. It's interesting to think that in Best of Both Worlds, there's no mention of the idea of the Borg assimilating everyone into drones. They swarmed through our system, and when they left, there was little or nothing left of my people. Remember, Locutus is a special case, being assimilated to be a mouthpiece. It's not ever made clear in this story that the Borg plan on turning humans into Borg drones. That idea came later. In Q Who, the first episode the Borg are in, they were basically described as only being interested in taking the technology a planet had to offer and having no interest in the inhabitants. They're simply interested in your ship. It's technology. They've identified it as something they can consume. So the writers had been trying to bring the Borg back in the right way throughout the whole third season, but they just didn't have any ideas that felt worthy of the new big bad guys. At this point, Rick Berman was really in charge of the show, and Michael Piller was number two. In case you don't know, 
Piller is often cited as the guy who saved the show and reinvented it in the third season, changing the focus from the sci-fi problem of the week to the emotional problems created by the sci-fi problems. It was Piller's idea to do a cliffhanger in the first place, and it's interesting to know that it was actually Gene Roddenberry who convinced him to stay with the show in that period over the summer when nobody knew how the best of both worlds would end. So it's really thanks to Gene Roddenberry that we got the ending that we did for this amazing story. And it's also thanks to Gene Roddenberry that Michael Piller stayed with the show and helped to guide it to the amazing plateau that it hit. Here's another interesting little thing to know. George Murdoch, who played Admiral Hansen, also played the alien posing as God in Star Trek V, The Final Frontier. I always found it interesting that his name was Hansen, and this is the biggest Borg episode of all time, and what's the last name of the main character in Voyager who used to be a Borg? If you said Hansen, you're right. Seven of Nine's real name is Annika Hansen. There is not much chance they're related, though. He spells it with an O, and she spells it with an E. So, since this is Star Trek Nitpickers, I've got to nitpick a little here and point out how odd it is the head doctor of the Enterprise goes on the away mission to the Borg Cube in Best of Both Worlds. And it turns out this is pretty much only because Gates McFadden, who played Dr. Crusher, mentioned to Michael Piller that it would be cool to fire a phaser. Don't get me wrong, I'm happy to have Crusher on that away mission, just nitpicking for the fun of it. Okay, so here's another quote from Ronald D. Moore. The story really goes to Michael Piller, who was running the writing staff in the third season when I joined the show. In the writer's room, we would often talk about revisiting the Borg. Piller said as the season went on that he thought there should be a cliffhanger, which Star Trek had never done before. And of course, guys, yeah, Star Trek is all about going where no one has gone before. So it only made sense for them to shake things up by doing an amazing cliffhanger. Got everybody talking about the show and wondering what's going to happen. And it's interesting to uh, hear Elizabeth Dennehy talking about how, you know, all of her friends were asking her, yeah, what's going to happen? And she was like, I don't know. I don't know. We didn't ever get to see the next script. I mean, Michael Piller hadn't even written it yet. It's pretty crazy to think of him basically writing himself into a corner and, you know, wondering if he kind of did it sort of like, uh, I don't know, you know, sort of a challenge, uh, if you want to put it that way, to whoever ended up getting his job because he basically thought he was leaving the show when he wrote part one. And then, of course, he's, you know, got to figure out, he's got to rise to the challenge that he set up for himself. And now this is sort of an interesting question. How well did he rise to that challenge? Because as popular an episode, a two-parter, whatever you want to call it, story for the next generation as Best of Both Worlds is, you can kind of hate on the ending a little bit. I mean, it's a little bit anticlimactic. I mean, I have to acknowledge I think it's great, and I especially love the way that it harkens back to Q Who, the first episode with the Borg, where we have them going on to the Borg cube, Riker and the away team, Data and Worf, and they're just walking around collecting information, and it's sort of ridiculous that they go over there to do this in the first place, but they're just like, well, we need more information. Visit the ship. In my opinion, that's the only choice. Assemble a minimal away team. What? And they're doing it, and it's going well, but then, you know, they hit on this idea that maybe the Borg are regenerating. Maybe they're asleep, and that is why they are not, you know, attacking and when Picard hears this, he's like, oh my gosh, you know, beam them back. Let's get out of here before they wake up. In effect, I put them all to sleep. So it's interesting that in the best of both worlds, 
their answer to the huge problem, their, you know, solution is to put the Borg to sleep. And it's sort of like, what? Are you kidding me? You're not going to blow them up? I, I thought maybe there'd be some real big explosions and everything. And of course there are, but you know what I'm saying. It's just kind of like, uh, oh, just Betty by time now. Okay. Anyways, guys, I would love to hear what you think about all of this. I'd love to know if you have any more behind-the-scenes information that would be cool to put into this ongoing story, because I know we're always going to be finding out more about little cool behind-the-scenes things for all of these amazing episodes, especially really legendary ones like the best of both worlds. So, hey, please do remember to subscribe. Please do like and share. Share with your friends, your enemies, your neighbors, anybody. And, uh, you know, maybe leave me a comment, too. And I do encourage you to go and listen to all of the Ciroc Lofton 7th Rule podcast with Elizabeth Dennehy. And really, they've got a lot of great content. So check it all out. It's great stuff. Subscribe to their channel. Thanks a lot, guys. Now, live long and prosper and... Kapla. Um, it was really hard to keep a straight face with them, especially when the ship gets hit. When you know, when <laughs> the first time, and they were like, "So is this a four? Is it a seven? Is it an eleven? What is it?" And I'm like, "What are you guys talking about?" And Jonathan said, "Well, if it's a, you know, if it's just like somebody sideswipes us, you know, it's like this." If it's a seven, we're holding on. And if it's a nine, we're flung, flung. And I said, you <laughs> are kidding me. I thought they were joking. I couldn't believe that that was the way they did it. And it was <laughs> like, like being with little kids doing, you know, it, it playing space alien, like playing make believe. It's, I couldn't believe that that was, you have all this technology of cameras flying through the air and that's how you do a hit. So it sounds funny. like it's gotta be embarrassing yes. on, the, on the day of like, you're like, are we really? Okay, I'll do it if you do it, I guess. It's literally play, <laughs> little kids playing make-believe. <laughs>